Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Talk Mass with your friends. It is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Josh Zelensky of Hopkins School. Today, he'll be speaking about heuristics in elementary number theory. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Zelensky. So let me find where that is. Okay, so. Uh, da, 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 full screen, okay. So as I said, uh, I'm Josh Zelinsky and I'm going to be talking about uh, heuristics and elementary number theory. All right. So we're going to first think about a notion called, which we've, most of us have probably seen before, the idea of a twin primes. All right, so we're going to say primes are twin if they differ by two. So examples are like five and seven or 11 and 13. But for example, 23 doesn't have a twin, right? 21 is composite and 25 is composite. All right. And then there are some really big examples like uh, this very large example here. Um, and uh, there's a whole long story of how they found that, uh, which is itself kind of interesting how, how you would go about finding something like that. But one thing that comes up when you see something like this is, are there infinitely many? Maybe they're only a finite number. Maybe that one is the biggest. So the first thing I'd like to do is to introduce, is to have us have some thought about that, some discussion. So what do people think there? I mean, I, my, my intuition is that primes get pretty sparse. And so um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be that shocked if it stops at some point. Yeah, like primes feel sparse. That seems to be a thing, right? So how many primes, this raises a, a question that's very closely connected is how sparse are primes? So, right? so there's certainly a feeling there. Um, and so Kim, uh, in the chat makes an interesting comment. Kim says, uh, primes, I assume infinities by default. So <laughs> I like Doug's answer. So Douglas, Douglas says, I think there are infinitely many only because that is a difficult answer and primes are prickly, right? So maybe, right, if there were a finite number, it's maybe easy to imagine we could prove that somehow. But yeah, if it's an infinite set that somehow feels tougher so if we think the primes are somehow bad and conspiring against us, maybe we should guess there are infinitely many twin primes because that seemed like, like the tougher situation. Don't, do, don't we think there are infinitely many, don't we think there are finitely many Fermat primes? Yeah, so that's actually one of the questions that's still we're gonna get tough. to. You, 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 you <laughs> stepped on a, uh, a bit we were gonna do in a little bit. We we're gonna do Mersenne and Fermat in a second, but yeah, that is the consensus. So, but hang on, let me go back to, so it turns out we really do believe there are infinitely many, and we're, we're really quite confident about this, although we can't prove it. Um, but what about primes of the form p equals two to the n minus one? So what is our feeling there? I feel like they're infinite. I think they're infinite too. And again, that's actually the consensus. They're called Mersenne primes. So they actually have an interesting history. Although twin primes feel very natural uh, to us, uh, you know, as a thing to think about, we actually don't have any records of anyone before the 19th century thinking about them. But these other primes, these Mersenne primes have been thought about since the ancient Greeks. Um, and we for a while have been pretty confident they're probably infinitely many. All right. And now we get to the Fermat primes, which was the other one. This is looks very similar, right? I've got one case I have a two to the n minus one, and the other one I have two to the n plus one. But in this case, we actually think they're only finitely many. And we actually think we have an entire list. But again, we can't prove it. Uh, at least we can't prove it with our known techniques today. So, so what's going on here? So the answer is heuristics, which is the topic of this of the, of the talk. All right, so I want to detour slightly because it will be a useful uh, direction to go in. Um, sorry. Uh, so I'm trying to move my, um, there we go, my, uh, uh, when I'm sharing screen, it's a little too big. The, uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of the, um, whatever, the zoom bar is being a little big. I'm not sure why. Okay, sorry. So I want to detour slightly about some talk about, uh, um, 
from Pierre de Fermat. And so he's this fellow from the 1600s and uh, there's a picture of him, which is the standard picture whenever you need to give any talk where you mention him. And so Fermat claimed that the following equation, x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no positive integer solution for n greater than two. Uh, and for a long time, this was the, one of the greatest unsolved problems in all of number theory, arguably all of mathematics. Uh, I was seeing Andrew Wiles proving this, uh, you know, the fact that he'd proven this in the early nineties was a, a formative experience of my mathematical youth. Um, I remember feeling old, one of the first times I felt genuinely old was realizing I was teaching students who were always going to be living in a world where Fermat's last theorem really was a theorem and not a conjecture. Um, it's, uh, but yeah, so he, so Fermat actually claimed he had a proof of this. Um, hang on, let me go back, slide. Uh, Fermat, sorry, Fermat claimed he had a proof of this, but he said famously, uh, I'm not going to remember the exact Latin, but a quote that's normally translated in English, I have a beautiful proof of this, but the margin is too small to contain it, which you've probably heard at some point some variation thereof. And Andrew Wiles's proof was over 100 pages, and it involves really, uh, um, uh, it involves really uh, very deep techniques, uh, which I have to say, I understood some of in grad school, but not even all of it. It's really quite difficult. Um, so it's definitely not a proof that would be content, you could fit in a margin, right? So it's definitely not the proof that uh, Fermat was thinking of if he genuinely had a proof. And the consensus at this point is he probably didn't. He was probably some errors in, error in it for a variety of reasons. All right, but let's look at a special case of it for a moment. So let's look at uh, just n equals four. And let's think about if we hadn't known Fermat's result, would we expect there to be infinitely many solutions to this equation or not? Or maybe just finitely many. And let's look at this. So let's try to do the following. Let's say, let's estimate how many numbers there are of the form a to the fourth plus b to the fourth up to a certain size. And then say, all right, assuming those were randomly distributed up to that size, how likely is it for one of them to hit a number that's also of self a fourth power now? So we'll look at this set. And I claim that the size of this set is not much bigger than x to the one half, right? Because there's about, X, the fourth root of X elements, and you know that are possible uh, combinations for one, and about the same number for the other. Oh, actually, that's my next uh, line. Sorry. All right. So at this point, we can say, all right, the expected number of solutions, right, should be about the chance that a given number. We've got X to the one fourth of them, and about one, sorry, x to the one half of them, and about x to the one fourth of those are themselves perfect fourth powers again. So the chance that a given element should be a perfect fourth power should be about one over n to the three halves. Um, okay, so there's a little algebra there, but that's the idea. And then we could say, okay, so if I tried to say, well, what if I wanted expected number of solutions? Well, let's just check naively the probability in quotation marks that a given number satisfies this and a given C and look at that series, right? That should give us the expected number of solutions if this were a random process. This is very much not a random process, right? Numbers are fixed concrete objects, but we're going to pretend it is. And so now we have this infinite series, n equals one to infinity, one over n to the three halves. And hopefully there's something we should notice about that series, which is, does anyone P notice any? What? It's a P-series. It's a P-series, yes. Thank you. It's a P-series, right? And it converges by the P-test, right? P is, uh, right? So this is way back from freshman calculus, yeah. So first year calculus, the series converges, all right. So that means that if this were a random process, we would say, hey, it goes to some fixed number, some finite number, 
we should expect we should expect that that number of solutions is itself finite because the expectation for how many we find is finite. And in this case, that's exactly what we get. There are in fact, no solutions, right? Okay, great. So that's a little bit of a, of a constructed silly example because I, oh, finitely many, well, if only zero, certainly there are no solutions. All right. So we can do this with other similar things. So a Diophantine equation is an equation where we only care about the integer solution. So like Fermat's equation, they generally have more than one variable and they generally can be quite difficult. Uh, and if you apply this sort of thing, uh, you can start saying, all right, well, I should expect infinitely many solutions for things where they're just quadratic generally. So like y squared minus two x squared equals one. Um, but I need to be a little careful. So I claim this very similar looking equation, y squared minus three x equals two only has finitely many solutions. In fact, it has none. So does anyone see why that might be the case? So there's a hint, if you've seen modular arithmetic, it helps you. So your perfect squares mod three are just one and zero. So y squared minus three x squared, who cares what it is, right? It, there's no way it's gonna be two. All right, so we have, but so the intuition we should develop at this point is something like an equation, if this heuristic sort of approach works, it should tell us an equation has infinitely many solutions, except if there's something silly, like a modular arithmetic issue or some even oddness, things like that. Um, all right. But if there's nothing like that, we should also, ex we should expect those to have only, have infinitely many. Here's a family of equations, which for almost any value A, B, and C, if you apply the same sort of series argument and try to find its expectation, you'll find that there are only finitely many, almost, right? There are some values of A, B, and C where I'll definitely have infinitely many. But again, it's for an essentially trivial, silly reason, right? And this is things like y squared equals x cubed. Well, obviously that has infinitely many integer solutions, right? Just set y equal to x squared and set, uh, sorry, y equal to a, I'm sorry, like a cubed and x equal to, you know, a squared. Uh, so, but uh, you can write down a very precise description of when the right-hand side factors. And it turns out, and this was a big theorem of uh, around 1900-ish, uh, that these equations really do only have finitely many integer solutions, except for the sort of thing that arises from factoring. Okay. So Josh, you may get to this, but, but Kim asked an interesting question. Like why why does the heuristic start by sort of pretending for randomness and how does that like because that's the um, is it maximizing inconvenience or incomprehensibility uh, or sort of conspiring against thisness? So the the thought process here is is, is actually a bit is is that this is something that we can do. There is a, there's a story about uh, a person who goes, uh, who's walking down a street at night and they see someone <laughs> under a lamppost, uh, staring down under the lamppost and the person's clearly inebriated. And the person, person says to the inebriated person, what, what are you doing? He says, well, he says, well, I left, I dropped my keys over somewhere on the street, oh, back there. He says, well, why are you looking back there? He says, well, why, aren't you, why aren't you looking back there? Why are you looking under lampposts? He says, well, this is where the light is. Right. So there's to some extent, right, these problems are very, very tough. Uh, so this is at least something we can get our hands on and get that's our concrete. The other intuition here is that very often, these sorts of things work is that we're certainly essentially saying uh, conspiracies, you know, the, the axioms of mathematics may have conspired against us on occasion. And we'll see a little bit of issues with that later. But those conspiracies can't happen all the time. 
Okay, we should hope don't happen that frequently. Right. Uh, one one way of thinking about this might be, you know, uh, if there's a god, you know, of mathematics, that god is hopefully sometimes capricious, but mostly merciful. And if there's no god, then randomness really should apply anyways. Um, but to some extent, right, our expectation should be that methods like this unless there's a conspiracy in the integers should work. Um, now, one needs to- what, what so, I was trying to do a conspiracy theory uh, talk, but sorry, Dave, what okay. was that? What, 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 yeah. So, your, so yeah. your, your elliptic curve there, yeah. yeah. Um, like roughly 50% of the time, it'll have infinitely many rational solutions, right? Yeah. So, so the difference here must have something to do with the uh, integer solutions versus the rational solutions? Yeah, there is some subtlety here about why this works for the integers and it doesn't work if you go to the rationals. And the short version is that if you did the rationals, it's not clear, it shouldn't be immediately clear what you would do as your expectation that would be a natural way of summing up all of your rationals, right? Sure, they're a countable set, but they don't have a nice order on them that lets you talk about an infinite series like that in a natural fashion that's very easy and obvious to sum up. Uh, and that's one of the difficulties going on there. Uh, there are some other issues too. Uh, one of the difficulties actually that connects to this is actually there is a, uh, a, a somewhat famous uh, example of what's called the um, uh, in elliptic curves, uh, the conjecture about whether or not all elliptic curves have a bounded rank. Uh, and it turns out that in that case, um, there actually are uh, heuristics that disagree with each other. Some people have tried to make sense of it one way, and some people have said that they're only bounded, and others have tried to do it a different way and gotten different. And so th there is some disagreement that this actually gets to something I'm going to talk about a little bit later called dueling heuristics, where it's, all right, what's your model of randomness? And this can be an issue. Uh, for a lot of the examples we're going to care about, though, it's mostly straightforward on what would be a reasonable model. And there's also sort of a, uh, an unreasonable effectiveness Darwinian selection sort of thing going on here. The, 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 the types of heuristics that, that seem to work get, keep getting used. Yeah, right. So, right, I mean, if we do resolve, right, the, the rank conjecture, my guess is there are going to be a bunch of heuristics that are going to be thrown out either for or against, and we're going to start looking at those a lot, you know, one group is going to get a lot more side eye in the future. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing to note here is that you can't, you definitely can't do this for all Diophantine equations. And we know there have to be at least some conspiracies. And that's because there's a very deep theorem uh, that, um, actually, it's surprisingly not deep. So I should say it's a big theorem, not a deep theorem, that solving Diophantine equations is actually equivalent to the halting problem which you can't do in general if you've seen the Turing halting theorem. And so if there was some really naive set of heuristics that would work for all diophantine equations, whether infinitely many or finitely many, you could sort of shove that in and then use that to you know, do something that we know you can't do. So there have to be some equations, at least in the diophantine context, where the, any heuristic you're using at least at any heuristic you pick, there has to be at least, and to get the quantifiers in the right order. Any heuristic you pick, there's gonna to have to be at least some Diophantine equations where it will fail. Um, but hopefully that's a small set, right? Or at least does not involve, you know, small equations that we're used to that don't things that have like 15 or a thousand variables or something like that, right? Okay. So let's uh, move then to do, try to do this for primes, right? Because, all right, it feels like we could probably do this now for, uh, you know, Diophantine equations that have just two variables. Uh, you, know, you might take a bit to sit down and do the details. It might take a little time, but I think we feel, should feel that there is some method that we could do. All right, so we immediately run into a problem, right? It's really easy to say how many squares are less than X or how many cubes are less than X, how many fourth powers are less than X, et cetera. How many primes are at most x? That seems a lot trickier. Okay. Luckily, we have an what? <laughs> Unless you're Gauss. 
Unless you're Gauss, mm -hmm. yes, because the following, in fact, was actually first conjectured by a number of people. Gauss may have been, I don't know if Legendre or Gauss conjectured this first, um, but it's you know, certainly one of those early, very brilliant people. Um, and it's the prime number theorem, although it wasn't proven from uh, much later. Uh, so it's pi of x count the number of primes which are at most x. So actually, it's interesting that this is a tough theorem that requires a lot of complex analysis. And so if you've you know, heard of Bernard Riemann and the Riemann hypothesis, that's connected to that whole story. Uh, but uh, de valle Poisson and Hadamard both independently proved this in 1896, both basically following suggestions of Riemann from about 30 or 40 years beforehand. All right. And so I should be clear by that little uh, tilde, we mean that the limit of the ratio of these two things goes to one. So it's not that the difference goes to zero. We couldn't be possibly that lucky, that good. Uh, you know, we couldn't be that lucky. But that the limit of the ratios equals one. Uh, and this is actually pretty good. Uh, so I think for if you plug in x equals 100, pi of x is 25. There are 25 primes under, under 100. And I think if you plug in x equals 100 to the right, you get like 21 or 22. So it's not a bad approximation, even at small values. Uh, one important thing to note, uh, I'm doing something which number theorists do, which some people find very distasteful, uh, which is I've written log x to mean natural log x. All right, number theorists do this. I've done it on all the slides. Um, if you don't like it, my apologies. Um, but uh, yeah, the, um, all right. So proving this is very hard. There is an easier theorem to prove uh, and this was actually was much earlier by, by Chebyshev, actually. And he proved that there are constants C1 and C2, such that at least pi of x is at least bounded above and below by constants times x over log x. So it doesn't get much, much bigger, and it doesn't get much, much smaller. And the good news from our from perspective, if you wanted to make everything here self-contained, is this theorem is enough to do the sorts of heuristics we care about. And this theorem has a relatively straightforward proof. Uh, so I don't know if Brian has posted to the chat a cop the link to the slides for this, but the very end of it is a whole bunch of slides, which are a proof of, which I know I'm not gonna get to today, but it is included a proof of Chebyshev's theorem. And it turns out that you really just need to do is just a little bit of careful thinking about Pascal's triangle to get his a version of his theorem. Um, so there's really, Unlike what uh, Passan and Hadamard did, unlike what Passan and Hadamard did, uh, which required complex analysis and you know, very deep things, uh, Chebyshev's result is really quite straightforward. Um, so if you want to take a look at it, there is a sketch of that proof. Uh, so again, you can make all of this completely self-contained. All of the heuristic sort of approaches we're going to do, in principle, could have done by anyone in 1851. Okay, so we know that the number of primes uh, under x is about x over log x. And so if you play around with this, um, you'll see that this means that the chance the number is prime, again, if we're assuming it's sort of being random, is about 1 over log n. And the nth prime is about n log n. Great, so now we can apply this to the twin primes. So the chance that the kth prime satisfies pk plus two also being prime should be about one over log pk plus two, okay. okay. And now we have a series again, an expectation. Let's say, all right, log n over one over log n plus two. The, we actually really have an n log n in both of those spaces but I'm taking a log of a log, right? So those are going to only change it by a tiny bit. So we might as well just write n there. And we should hopefully notice something about that series. It diverges, right? Yeah, it diverges. And so if that series diverges, we should expect there should be infinitely many twin primes. Okay. All right. So that's, at least for the twin prime reason, is the basis for being pretty confident there really are infinitely many of these, right? So it's not just that mathematicians have gone out and found very large examples and said they don't seem to be stopping, but rather, but rather that we actually really should expect that there are infinitely many, right? We would believe this 
even if some people had not been spending tremendous amounts of time and thought on making very clever algorithms to search for these and spending far more computational power on this than probably I will ever have the budget to be allowed to do anything on. Um, but we actually have a good reason for this. Thing. Okay. So let's so Josh, go back. Going back yeah. to that one, um, I haven't thought through the details, but could the same thing end up being like log to the fourth in the denominator if you try to say like there's an yeah. infinitely number of pairs of uh, twin primes that are adjacent to each other. So there's a twin pair here and then the next pair is twin. Like yeah. so you, you just end up with more logs. Right, you'll end up with more logs. You need to be, well actually that's gonna be on a later slide. So you're anticipating oh. this, but that's good. No, so you're right. And so we need to be careful again because there may be silly reasons, right? So I claim, for example, that three, five, seven, and nine are the only set of primes where they're each two away from the next. And that's because one of them has to be divisible by three. Nine. <laughs> what? You said nine. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, not what I meant. Um, what was the example I wanted? Um, you wanted to joke to a 13. And I wanted some small, there was some small example just, like that. I don't just know. three, five, seven. Yeah. Three, five, seven. Thank you. So there are only yeah. three twin primes in a row. That's the example one. Nine is definitely not prime. Okay, sorry. Yes, three, five, seven. This is one of the dangers of having a talk be recorded. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry. So three, five, and seven. So if you have three numbers that each differ by two, a pair of them is going to have to be divisible by three. But if we said, well, what if we made them a little apart, right? So what if we looked at primes where I'd two twin primes and they, the, but the bigger, you know, but they would fall apart in the middle. So like 101, 103, 107, and 109 are all prime. Then we should expect, we should expect, sorry, we should expect infinitely many of that sort, right? And in fact, we do. And there's a, a broader conjecture that we'll get to in a slide in a little bit. Um, but, uh, sorry, there's another question. Nope, oh. that's it. Okay, all right. So let's recall then we wanted to do this with Mersenne primes. And these are the primes that are one less than a power of two. All right, so we do the same thing. And we do this and we say, all right, I'm subtracting one here, but look, I'm gonna be taking a log of like a big number. Subtracting one just isn't changing it that much, right? If you wanted to do a, a rigorous thing, you would use a, I think the ratio test back from you know, Calc 1, right? You'd say, hey, these have the same ratio and you probably use L'Hopital's rule to get that the ratio test works here or some other similar process. But you, once you've done that, you have one is sum n equals one to infinity, one over log two to the n. All right, n goes down. Again, now we're back into even pre-calc. And we're like, hey, that diverges because that looks like the harmonic series, except I've got a factor of log two floating down there, which doesn't make a difference. Okay. So we should expect there to be infinitely many Mersenne primes. Alarm bells may be going off at this point. When n is composite, two to the n minus one factors and can't be prime. So it feels like I'm counting way too many numbers here that are just in some sense, never gonna get a chance to be prime due to randomness because if I picked an N that was composite, well, it gets a factorization for free, right? In some sense, this is similar to what we were doing earlier where we said, well, if there's a modular arithmetic issue, right? That this feels like a silly reason to prevent things and we should make sure those don't happen, all right? So instead, let's do the same sum, and we'll only do it over those n which are themselves prime. Now we've got good news, which is that still diverges. All right, so if we remove, call that the nth prime is about n log n, plug that in, hey, look that in, that's still gonna diverge. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we should still expect there are infinitely many with sun primes, even if we, when we make that correction. And one thing to note about the Mersenne primes that's sort of interesting here is this is in some sense, they're base two, a very base two specific number. So a Mersenne prime really is 
a prime number, which is all ones in its base two expansion. And if you wanted to say, look at any other base you like, uh, some people like base 10, I'm not sure why. Um, I think it like has to do with the number of fingers or something, I don't know. Uh, but, but if you like base 10, you might kind of say, well, what if we did the same thing and looked at what we call rep unit primes, which are primes are all ones, uh, uh, all, all, the, all the values are one. And so you'd also get a similar result and expect that there are infinitely many there. So maybe, uh, and I'll just note that the largest one again, because some people apparently care about base 10, the largest one known is 1,031 ones all in a row is prime. So now you can do a really, a really great stunt after COVID if you go to a party, is when you see someone, you want to make an icebreaker, you can say, hey, I have an 1,031 digit prime memorized. And then if they ask you, you can start saying one, 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 one. If they're a fun person, they'll laugh and it's great. And if they walk away, they probably won't worth talking to anyways. So that's my gift to you for your post COVID getting back to being normal social human beings. Josh, that's awesome. Is it okay if I call it the Zelensky sieve? <laughs> I, I would love it if that if that would, if you would use that phrase. Yes. So, okay. But but let's try to apply this then to Fermat primes. All right. So if I have a Fermat prime, right, that's p to two, two n plus one. We're still sometimes going to get a factorization, but now the factorization actually happens when k is odd. Uh, so it comes from this factorization here. Uh, way of factoring. Uh, it's a little more complicated than the factorization we had earlier, but it's the same idea. And you can check that this factorization works and everything cancels except the first and the last term. Okay. And if you uh, remember, actually, you may have seen this factorization in a different context, which is, is sometimes used um, when in one proof that people sometimes do in calculus for the uh, derivative of x to the n. Uh, is n x to n minus one. Some was doing that with the h going to zero. Sometimes you use a, a variant of this. Uh, okay. So we've got a problem here. When n is, uh, we only need to have n being a power of two because if n is not a power of two, I could pick a k and an l where k is some odd factor greater than one, and we'd have a problem. All right. So uh, we want to only sum over the n that are powers of two and do the same thing we did earlier. All right, same thing, ratio test, right? That plus one just is not gonna matter much, right? Either if you want to be rigorous, you can use the ratio test or you can just look at it and say, hey, it's not gonna matter much. But now, oh no, that series converges because those terms are two to the n there. And that's a geometric series, right? With fast converging, right? That goes zero, those terms go to zero really fast. That series definitely converges. So in that case, our expectation should be the only finitely many from our prime. All right. And at least empirically, something like this seems to happen. So we have 51 Mersenne primes known. Uh, and only five Fermat primes, and they're all tiny. Um, but uh, I, I just realized actually that I haven't, uh, I should have probably checked that number was 51. I think I wrote this slide without actually going to like Wikipedia or somewhere to check that one had, I hadn't missed one gotten updated. But uh, 51, maybe 52 if I'm misremembering one, if I forgot about one. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, oh, that's an interesting question. So Kim Reese in the chat asked, can silly reasons ever increase the number of solutions? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I think it can in the Diophantine case, right? Because you can get factorizations. I think it's tough to do that in the prime case in most natural context, because it's hard to avoid factors. That said, there are two recent papers that do give an example where a 
a very narrow version of this where you're trying not just to get into their finitely many or infinitely many, but actually approximately how many, then you can have weird things where factorizations are prevented. Um, actually, not just two recent papers, actually that's two examples I'm thinking of, but it's an old idea. And so that actually can lead to there being more if you care about not just finitely many, infinitely many, but roughly how many. Uh, but generally, not an, there's not enough interaction there to change the basic infinite to finitely many from natural examples I know about. Okay, but we have problems with this method. So one thing that we might be feeling a bit is we keep saying some conditions are silly and we need to take them into account. It's not really clear what a condition is as silly. All right, we had modular arithmetic, we had factorization. Are those always the only silly things? Maybe there are other things. How do I decide what's a silly thing? Right? Or what's, what, what am I allowed to take into account or not? And so they're actually, when you try to do this for more subtle sets, rather than just twin primes and descent primes, it can be, this can be a real question of what, what really is silly or not. And this can lead to what I mentioned earlier, dueling heuristics. Someone will say, well, I'm taking into account this probability and this issue and this issue, and this gets infinitely many. And someone else will say, no, you need to do it this way. And now you get finitely many. So how do you decide what's going? The other issue that can happen is convergence may be sensitive, right? So I was careful to, to, to take examples where, first of all, those are simpler examples, but also examples where the series weren't that close to either, you know, the boundary between convergence and divergence, right? So we had some that were growing very, very fast, and we had some that were growing very slowly, but we didn't have much near that boundary. Right. So if you try to do this sort of thing, some things you'll end up with like, well, there's like it converges, but only because there's like a log, log, log power in the right place. And then you're like, well, in that case, it could very well be that you'd only need not a big conspiracy, you know, to get, you know, everything to work out, right? You don't need a giant QAnon conspiracy to get the set to change its converge. You just need like one person on the grassy knoll. Um, so that's, uh, you know, so that's an issue is right is as you get more complicated sets, how much do you think a small correction uh, taking a small new thing into account will somehow cause it to change from convergence to divergence of the reverse. Um, so that's an issue there. Uh, so let's extend this to polynomials. Uh, when we expect the infinitely many prime values of a given polynomial. For example, the infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus one. So again, we're going to have the same basic idea. All right. And it turns out that uh, we always, for any integer of all polynomials, except again, obvious cases, it's constant, it factors, or it's always divisible by some specific number. Our expectation is there should always be infinitely many primes. What about pairs of polynomials being simultaneously prime? What if I had like n squared plus one and 30 times n plus one? Can I pick infinitely many n where that's the case? And this actually gets to what Brian was saying earlier of, oh, well, I'm just adding log factors, right? And so our feeling should be, if I'm just adding log factors, uh, it shouldn't really make a difference. And so a mathematician by Shinzel made something called hypothesis H that says, as long as essentially the three above issues or certain minor variations on them don't occur, we should really expect there to be infinitely many, right? For any, so. Sorry, You're gonna have to explain the name of hypothesis H. I don't know like, where the, the name came from actually. Okay. Uh, if so, someone else does, they're, they're welcome to chat. I don't know how it got named that though. Uh, so let me just say there's a blink in the chat. So let me. Uh, it sounds uh, to me like H is for hypothesis. That could be. Yeah. I I really so always thought he just had a paper with a whole bunch of hypotheses, and that was the most it's certainly possible. I have one. to confess, <laughs> I, it's never occurred to me to wonder where the name came from. So I've never actually tracked down the original paper. So uh, um, 
And but now I, I should now go do uh, one of us. I'll, I'll try to go do that and think, find out. But yeah, it might be that there were, you know, hypotheses is eight. Maybe it even went through like, I don't know, A through Q or something or A through R. And you know, H is the one that stuck around as being important. I, I, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, okay. Great. But, but he says essentially, except for variance of these three issues, and you need to be a little careful about what you mean by variance. Yeah, there should always be infinitely many primes for any set. Um, and this is something I mentioned earlier, but it's worth saying, uh, more careful use of these methods can actually get expectations for how many numbers in the given set there are of size at most x. So not just infinitely many, but hey, let's use this expectation thing and say, really, how many do we actually expect? How rare is the set? How common is it? Et cetera. And, um, and actually doing this and trying to make this notion precise and not just heuristically precise, but really mathematically precise is a major method of, you've heard of sieve theory um, in the last few years. So this has been a big issue. All right. So for example, if we set pi two of X to be number of twin primes that are at most X, then we have a conjecture that pi two of x is about x over log x squared times a constant. And we can write down what that constant is explicitly. Um, and then there's another conjecture called Bateman-Horn. And that conjecture generalizes hypothesis H. And it gives you for any set of polynomials, tells you exactly how many you, well, not exactly, but again, how many you expect in the same sense of this sort. And it gives you asymptotic approximations there. Bateman Horn is probably one of the problems where we're not going to prove it anytime soon. It is conceivable to me that someone will prove some version of hypothesis H in our lifetime, although it seems unlikely. Um, I don't think Bateman Horn is happening anytime soon, though. Like, if, like, I f it's on my list of things where, like, if I somehow fall into a glacier and then I'm like, revived a thousand <laughs> years later by like super science, like, one of my questions will be Bateman Horn. But uh, uh, I'm not necessarily even optimistic there, but it's possible. Uh, I, I should add that one of my uh, uh, one of my professors when I was doing my PhD actually thought Bateman Horn was false, and uh, essentially thought that there probably were some more subtleties about the values going on that we haven't. Uh, really taken into account. Um, but then he also would say, uh, don't quote me on that because he wasn't really certain. Not. So I'm saying it without his name here. Um, <laughs> but but, it's, but it, there's certainly more doubt about Bateman-Horn. We're, we're pretty confident about hypothesis H. The real difficulty with Bateman-Horn isn't just that it gives you the correct growth value as an order, but it actually tells you exactly what the constants are. And I think there really is some uncertainty. Should we really trust that these methods are so good that they really give you not just the correct order of growth, but the actual constant, like those C values themselves. All right. So one thing we can look at is if we're trying to actually prove results. Uh, so we could, instead of looking at twin primes, we could look at primes of the form P and P plus K. And, um, at minimum, we expect there's some constant C, such as infinitely many primes where you know, they're at least C away from each other, right? That's much, much weaker than the tw twin prime conjecture, right? If, if we can't prove something, what do we do? We try to, well, find something even weaker we can't prove. Um, but the good news is now we can prove this. Um, so this was shown in Yiting Zeng to be true for some C. And he actually got uh, um, around 70 million. Um, and um, for the value, but his we didn't try. And then a whole massive number of mathematicians uh, worked on trying to get this number down to smaller values. Uh, it was actually called a polymath project. Uh, and they um, uh, worked hard on, they got down to 246. And there was actually the summer of, I think it was the summer of 2014, they were doing this. And it almost felt like as someone who was not good enough on this methods they were using to really actually help contribute, although there were literally hundreds of people working on it, uh, using like a wiki for it and all this stuff and some blog entries. Um, it was really, really cool to watch the number creep down. I'm not that much of a fan of organized sports, but I imagine seeing that number creep down and getting a vicarious thrill from it was similar to seeing like a, you know, a baseball score or a football score move up. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and so it's now stuck at 246. Obviously we think the real value for C should be two, but that looks very, very tough, uh, but all right. So I wanna do one more example because I think I, as I have a few more minutes, uh, because I think whenever you give a talk, if you can, you could always at least plug one of your own results. Um, and so that these sorts of techniques aren't just being used for class, also just these classical series like the Fermat primes that you know were being thought of hundreds of years ago, but we really are being used to think about modern things. So hopefully we remember our friends the Fibonacci sequence, you know, we one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, et cetera. Uh, every term is you know the sum of the previous two. So we can set Fn as the nth Fibonacci number and ask of the infinitely many Fibonacci primes. So if you do these sorts of things and it turns out you play around with it, you'll get probably yes. So this has been a conjecture for I think around a hundred years or so. All right. And the largest known currently is F104911, which was proven by Matt Stein in Book de Water in 2015. Um, and there's actually a whole fun story about how they were able to verify that such a large number is prime. Uh, it, it's not easy. Um, so, okay, there's a nice result that if FP is prime, then P is prime. And it actually involves uh, an argument pretty similar to the one we did with the Mersenne prime, but it's a little more subtle. Uh, so you don't get in a nice algebraic factorization, but it's a very similar sort of so one question we can immediately ask, well, not immediately, uh, but we can ask is there infinitely any n such that fn and fn plus two are both prime? Because hey, if n is prime and n plus two are prime, right, that's a twin prime pair, maybe we can get lucky and fn and fn plus two are both prime. So this question was actually asked in a paper by Sean Bibby, Peter Venk, and myself. Uh, actually, well, I should say a preprint, but uh, still in um, the archive. Uh, and we, sure the, we expect the answer to be no, based on the same sorts of heuristics here. Uh, you'll, you'll notice here that my name gets to go last. One of the downsides <laughs> of being in math, you know, is since we do all everything alphabetically, uh, you get, uh, you know, I, I will never be for, for seen as first author. I've had to actually explain this to some of my uh, relatives who are a little disappointed that they never see me as the first author on a paper. It's like, yes, yes, it's alphabetical. Um, although I will say that Sean and Peter did a lot, a lot of work on this. So I might have been third author anyways, even if we were a field that, that, uh, that did things that way. You just need to pick your co-authors more carefully. Yeah, so my mm -hmm. first co-author effort was Harry Altman with an A. So I really wasn't doing a good job there. Uh, okay. Um, and there's a related sort of earlier result, actually, it's actually not just a result, uh, well, but actually is a actual, not just a heuristic, but an actual result due to Nick McKinnon, who showed that three, five, and 13 are the only Fibonacci primes, which are members of a twin prime pair. So note, this is a little different than what we were looking at, right? Because McKinnon is looking at uh, plus two, essentially, or minus two, but not in the subscript, right? Whereas Sean, and Pieter, and me are looking at it, you know, when it's in the subscript there. All right, so why do we care about this, right? Did we just decide to think about, I don't know, pairs of, of uh, Fibonacci primes? So there is actually a, uh, a reasonable uh, reason for this. So let's sigma of n be the sum of the positive divisors of n. So this is a function that people have been thinking about since the ancient Greeks. Uh, so for example, sigma of four will be one plus two plus four. So one thing you can ask, and this generalizes a whole bunch of pre-existing problems, uh, for what a and b does one have a divide sigma of b and b divide sigma of a? This problem is insanely tough, right? This is a massive set of numbers. I don't know how you're going to classify them all, whatever. So, but one thing you can do is restrict it to prime powers. All right. And now things are much, much easier, it turns out, or at least easy enough that people like me can prove things about them, right? Okay. So we'll call such a pair of sigma m n pair where P divides sigma of Q to the N and Q divides sigma of P to the N. And so we analyzed a whole bunch of small cases of M and M. And one of the cases was sigma three, three. And we were able to say that except for a small set of finite cases, sigma three, three pairs actually are exactly coming 
from a pair of Fibonacci prime, primes like this that are exactly two indexes apart. Uh, if they are that, then you get a uh, you get a three three pair. And if you have a three three pair, again, other than a small set of cases, you can easily write down involving certain small primes. They have to come from this. So if you want to understand sigma mn pairs, this is a natural question to ask. Is that a, is that a relatively elementary argument? Yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty elementary. I should note that the version of the paper that's currently has, has one lemma not for this, but for a related thing where the proof in it is the current version on the archive has a proof which is not quite correct. And that's not Sean or PH's fault, that's mine. Um, so don't blame them on it, but uh, it's not relevant to this part. The whole technique, everything we're doing though is highly elementary. Uh, it's actually a fun story of part of what happened here. I actually was thinking about a related problem for sigma two, two pairs. And I mentioned it on a Reddit thread on the math Reddit, what are you doing? And uh, Sean and Pedro, who I'd never interacted with before, Sean actually then came up with a counterexample to my, one of my conjectures by doing a lot of comp computing power. And I said, well, how did you get that pair? Because even computing power wasn't obvious. It's like, oh, I noticed this other pattern uh, and then Pieter chimed in and was like, oh, I can prove your pattern. And so that started the collaboration. Um, but uh, there, so, but um, yeah, so it's all very elementary arguments um, and um, it's a reasonably readable. Um, it has some, actually some other motivation there that was part of the primary motivation. It turns out this connects very closely to uh, uh, trying to understand odd perfect numbers. Uh, another one of those problems would not go, no one is going to solve anytime soon, but, maybe you can make a teeny bit of progress on. Okay. All right, so that uh, is basically where I wanted to stop. Uh, the remaining slides are uh, mostly about the Chebyshev. Oh, and I did have one other slide, which was in case anyone was wondering, I did check. No, I did check. So it is 51 primes then, because this is the largest uh, Mersenne prime currently known. So, but that's a good stopping point, I think. So thoughts or questions then? Hey, Clay, please join me in uh, thanking Josh. We have a few minutes for questions. <laughs> so you, Josh, you, you teach high school, yes? Yes. Um, and you seem really excited about sort of elementary methods in the sense of like, you don't need to know powerful analysis in order to start playing with these. Are those two things connected? Uh, yes, uh, in that it's a lucky, lucky it is true. Uh, so, um, but I've been interested in elementary methods for a very, very long time. Um, I consider myself to be sort of a, uh, although not nearly as successful, but sort of a, the same spiritual family of how you think about things as Carl Pomerantz and Paul Erdős and people like that, who really do use a lot of elementary methods. That's also because honestly, a lot of these deep methods involving L functions and categories and stuff, I've never really gotten to understand well enough to use myself very well. Um, so there is that. But uh, yeah, so that is part of it. And I think the truth is also is that there's a lot of really elementary stuff and techniques to use. And sometimes people will immediately start trying to bash something with a high level technique when elementary one can actually give you some pretty good insight and might even solve it. And I think there are a lot of, if, if it was up to me, one of the things we would do with ad students in number theory would be like, okay, you've got all these high level techniques learn some of the really classical ones, you know, also because sometimes they work. Uh, in the high school context, actually, um, so the high school I teach at actually hired me to teach this wonderful, one of the things they hired me for, I teach regular classes also including calculus and pre-calc. One of the classes I teach is actually what they call their seminar. And so this is for students who have finished up the standard high school curriculum. And then each year we get to do some, higher level, you know, undergrad level class. And one of the things I actually introduced to that class, which I'm quite proud of, is the second semester, we tried to do a small research project on it, uh, related to it. So uh, last year, we actually did do number theory as the topic, um, and we're, uh, and, you know, and so then of the seminar, and so they did a small research project, which we're hopefully going to clean up to get into present presentable form, although getting kids who've just graduated from high school to actually you know, sit down with you enough to write up their results well is tough. Um, 
But then this year, actually, we did the seminar on graph theory. And actually, the problem they're actually working on is actually a problem that's connected to something from another uh, talk math with your friends. So there was a talk by, I'm blanking on who gave it, but on uh, total difference labeling. Um, um, I don't remember who it was anyway. And so the problem they're actually one of the, we're actually working on is as uh, their research project now is total difference labeling of some nice uh, infinite graph. So like the square lattice and things. Uh, actually, they just actually today got a, a, a better result that the square lattice is total difference labeling we had was between eight and 14 a few days ago. And they just got it down to 10 during like a marathon. Uh, hour of like really good ideas coming in. So um, I'm really quite happy with that. But yeah, so there is that sort of connection, but yeah. I went, cool. entirely, I went entirely backwards in my uh, learning of number theory uh, uh, in college. I, I was interested in algebra. My senior year, I got interested in algebraic number theory, never having, to, never having taken elementary number theory. Wasn't until I had to teach number theory as a postdoc that I actually learned some of the elementary stuff. One of the, I'll say on that, that one of the best books I actually recommend to people if they don't really feel like elementary number theory is their, their thing, you know, or is this wonderful book by Paul Pollock called Not Always Buried Deep. Mm -hmm. And it's all about using very elementary techniques to really get, you know, do just really amazing stuff. And so you could in principle, right, there's nothing in the book which requires complex analysis. If even, even calculus is, you know, no more calculus than someone would have seen again in a, in a you know, basic Calc 1 class. And just does absolutely amazing things, you know, bounds on, you know, things like the twin prime. So how many, maybe you can get upper bound at least, he shows how you can at least get an upper bound on how many twin primes there are less than a given X. And a lot of stuff done in a really great way. And it's really, I, um, it's a book I can't, uh, can't, can't plug enough, frankly. Uh, I think I found the total labeling video on our YouTube channel, Rhonda. Yeah. Yeah, that's who it was. Yes. So great. All right. Um, well, we only have one minute, so I'll do my little wrap up, which is to share my screen um, and say that next week we have Juliet Bruce, who's at UC Berkeley slash MSRI. She's a, a postdoc there right now, uh, talking about graphs, cones, dark matter, and beyond. I don't think Juliet is here, so I'll just leave that up. And if everyone would unmute and join me in thanking Josh for a really interesting session today. That's great, Josh. Thank you very much. Thank you.